how long did you say your stroke recovery took or are you still chasing better health or a better outcome? What's that like? I, I think I think you're always recovering. Uh, there's, there's certain things that I know I can't do. Um, but like you say, life gets in the way. You know, the way I look at myself right now is I'm a million dollar woman. Um, I've got um, a pacemaker. Uh, I broke my hip and had a hip replacement. <laughs> so my husband told me that I was a high maintenance woman. And he said, why don't you just go to the store and go shopping? <laughs> Do something low risk. Yeah, exactly. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to Recovery After Stroke, a podcast full of answers, advice and practical tools for stroke survivors to help you take back your life after a stroke and build a stronger future. I'm your host, three-time stroke survivor, Bill Gassiamis. After my own life was turned upside down and I went from being an active father to being stuck in hospital, I knew if I wanted to get back to the life I loved before, my recovery was up to me. After years of researching and discovering, I learned how to heal my brain and rebuild a healthier and happier life than I ever dreamed possible. And now I've made it my mission to empower other stroke survivors like you to recover faster, achieve your goals and take back the freedom you deserve. If you enjoy this episode and want more resources, accessible training, and hands-on support, check out my Recovery After Stroke membership community. Created especially for stroke survivors and caregivers, this is your clear pathway to transform your symptoms, reduce your anxiety, and navigate your journey to recovery with confidence. Head to recoveryafterstroke.com to find out more after this podcast episode. But for now, let's dive right into today's episode. This is episode 155, and my guest today is Joanne Glynn. Joanne experienced a hemorrhagic stroke aged 52 and wrote her book, Trapped Within, to help other stroke survivors. Joanne Glynn, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. We finally made it. We had one <laughs> attempt a week ago, and it just goes to show you that if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> we we learned that to having strokes. You never give up. Exactly right. And we weren't going to let technology get in our way of <laughs> catching up. That's right. <laughs> Joanne, can you tell me a little bit about what happened to you? Um, I was 50 years old. And I take that back, I was 52. And um, my husband and I had just moved to Florida. Um, he had retired earlier that year. And um, so we, we had known all along we wanted to move to Florida. We just could not take those cold Chicago days anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did. And for six months, it was wonderful. We'd get up in the morning and say, okay, well, what are we going to do today? And we would just go out and have a good time and travel all over and see different things. There was one night um, we sat and watched um, the news, and they said that there was a launch going up over at Kennedy Space Center. And that's on totally on the opposite side of where we are. We're on the Gulf side of Florida. And this was on the east side. Well, Florida is so narrow, it only took us an hour and a half. So we laid down to connect, got up around 10 o'clock, drove over there, found a place to park. 20 minutes later, this amazing rocket took off. And the, the sky looked as bright red is my background, and uh, the earth shook under our feet, and we said, wow, and it was gone, and we came home. But those were the things that we could do that we looked forward to doing for all these years. 
But then in February, we decided that maybe we need to start getting back into the routine of the real life again. And I had worked for Kelly Services for um, 16 years. Um, started off just as a file clerk, took all their classes and worked my way up to management and spent about nine of the 16 years working as an on-site supervisor at uh, Baxter Healthcare, which I just, I loved the whole experience. And so um, anyway, when I was down here, um, I took a, a one day assignment and uh, and got over there in the morning and I was ready to go and kind of going through my checklist of everything I needed to do. And uh, by noon, um, the uh, woman who had that position had forgotten to order the sandwiches for this conference room where there was about 12 or 13 people. I said, oh, don't worry about it, I'll go take care of it. So I did and went down to this place that they usually use. Um, I really kind of coerced the guy into doing all these lunches because it was last minute. You coerced and, him uh, to make lunches. Wow, that's terrible. <laughs> but yeah, down there and uh, uh, I sat and waited for him and watched all these boxes piling up and went up to pay him. And I asked him, how much do I owe you? And he came out sounding like Russian. And he was from another country and he just looked at me like he thought I was making fun of him. And I felt bad about that. So I swallowed hard and I asked again and it sounded just as bad. So I just handed him the uh, credit card and I took a, a, a box uh, with me couple of boxes and started to walk out to the car and I felt my legs turn to jello and I just I sat there and just willed myself not not to fall and um, not that you can do that the stroke is always going to lead whatever you do but you, you think you can you couldn't convince your stroke to not to stop you from falling that's interesting. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought I was, but I learned a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so did anyway, you I got out to the car and someone else had brought all the other sandwiches and put them in there. I knew I couldn't talk to him, so I just blew him a kiss and off I went. Well, I found that with my right hand, when I was trying to drive back, and I was working at Tropicana for the day, and if you like orange juice, you know Tropicana. And so I was driving back over there and I kept putting my right hand up on the steering wheel and it kept falling off down onto the seat of the car alongside me. And no, no willpower was getting it to do anything except that. So, I, I drove along, I'm always one, especially in a crisis situation that I try to plan, you know, two or three things. If this doesn't work, how about this? If this doesn't work, how's this, you know? And there had been a flea market that was absolutely huge that had burnt down. And I mean, it was just ashes. And uh, so I thought, well, it was on the way back and I thought, if I, if I do get worse, I'm just going to pull up into that field and eventually somebody will find me. And so, but I didn't need to do that. I made it back to Tropicana. And when I walked in there and, and I knew I was really very seriously ill, and, and in my mind, I knew I had had a stroke. And the only thing I wanted to do was to be able to tell my husband one more time that I loved him before I died, because I knew I was going to die. My mother had passed away from a stroke when I was 14. And so I didn't see any possibility of living through this. That's just the way strokes happen. So I called my husband and um, 
he answered the phone and I tried to tell him what was going on and there was this long pause. And finally he said, I'm sorry, but I think you have the wrong number. And I just burst into tears going, no, I've got to tell him, I've got to tell him. And so the only thing I could get out was October 19, which was our anniversary. And so uh, he went silent and he was, what's wrong with you? And all I could say was, I'm sick. And I hung up. And I went to the hospital. Of course, I looked around and there's all these people at lunchtime. They're walking back and forth because they're coming in from lunch. And the car was out in front and the motor was still running. And I tried to convince myself that it would be a good thing to call 911. And I decided I don't like doctors. I just don't like doctors. <laughs> and so I chose plan B and got in the car and drove myself the extra maybe 10 blocks to the hospital. And when I got over there, I drove into the parking lot and there was no place to park. I mean, the place was full. So I parked in a place for ambulances. And by this time, my mouth is drooping. I didn't know if I'd be able to walk or not. And there's this man that came up on a golf cart. He was security. And he came up on the golf cart and told me, I'm sorry, man, but you can't park there. And I looked at him and I said, I think I'm having a stroke. And he looked at me and he said, don't worry about your car. I'll keep an eye on it for you. And then he put it off. I'm going, be nice if you help me. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, wow. So I got myself out. Well, by this time, my shoulder is drooping. I'm limping my mouth is to the side. And I walked in, and with my last little bit of nerve, I just stood right there in the entryway because nobody was looking up. They're always used to the bush at the doors. And so... Nobody's looking up, and I just said, I think I'm having a stroke. And one of the nurses turned around, she, she walked in here, and all of a sudden people came running from everywhere, and I don't remember anything after that. Wow, that's dramatic. I mean, it's such a survival story, isn't it? I mean, you've gone out of your way to survive and get help, find a way to um, be safe, tell the people that were important to you what was going on, and then get medical help and get somebody to treat you seriously. It's a very common story from stroke survivors. It's a very common story where people don't take them seriously or they go to a hospital and they get misdiagnosed as being drunk or on drugs or on some or, or, or something else. But um, you finally got there. You don't remember anything after that moment when you announced that to them that you were uh, potentially having a stroke. What's the next thing you remember? Well, I have, I have little flashes. I can't say I don't remember anything, but I have little flashes like the, the back of the wheel on the, on the gurney as they were rolling me down for x-rays. And uh, um, just, just a couple of little things. Um, I remember Bill coming to the room and having a chance to talk to him before you know, things went um, kind of blurry. But I spent, I'm, now I'm guessing because I don't recall, but I think it was about two weeks in the hospital. And then I was sent over to a rehab place and spent about three months in there. And when I got to rehab is when I started having bits and pieces of memories. Um, my, my brain was totally Teflon. You know, you could tell me something, it would just slip in one side and slip out the other. Yeah. So it, it took a while before I was able to recall a full day. Yeah, I had a um, very similar story to you. Your, 
your getting to the hospital story was very interesting. So I had a, a bleed in February of 2012, and then I had a bleed um, six weeks later. And then I had one in November of 2014. So in the three, almost three years between the first bleed and the second bleed, um, I experienced different versions of uh, stroke. And the second version, the second bleed, meant that I didn't know my name when I got to hospital. I didn't know uh, who I was. I, I remember going there with my wallet to try and tell them I need help. My wife had dropped me off um, and we were talking in the car minutes, minutes earlier with no issue. And then by the time I walked the 100 yards to get to the uh, emergency uh, screening area, I, I didn't know who I was. And then I remember waking up a little later on and my wife was at the end of my bed and I didn't know who she was. I didn't recognize her. Mm -hmm. um, that was that time. And then the second, the third time I was um, in our central business district here in Melbourne on some business. And uh, I started to notice the, the burning sensation on my left side. And I figured that it was a stroke after doing some things that were, quite strange. I got out the car, I walked around the car to make sure that this thing, whatever it was, was going to go away. It didn't. So I jumped back in the car and then I drove myself to the hospital. There was nowhere to park. So I parked in an illegal spot. <laughs> I rang my wife on the mobile phone and told her on the cell phone and told her, uh, I'm on the way into hospital right now. I'm feeling unwell etc. And then I got to emergency and I went to emergency and I said to him, I'm having a stroke, get me into the, get me into the uh, x-ray right now or something like that. And of mm. course, they didn't believe me because <laughs> nobody does that people don't just turn up and tell them what condition yeah. they have and how to deal yeah. with it. So they finally worked it out and they got me through into x-ray or into CT, I imagine. And when we got into the CT scan area, Usually there's one or two radiographers that are, ha are hanging around there to take the photos. This time the, the glass room behind the scanning room was full of people. Everyone came to have a look and see who this weirdo was that turned up to say, I'm having a stroke. Um, so I can really relate to that survival story, that part of you that is just, I don't know what was it like for you for me it was like it was i don't know it was whether it was instinct or i'm not sure how to describe it but there was nothing going on other than something else was pushing me to overcome all of the neurological condition the barriers everything that was happening the cognitive issues that i was having somehow i drove myself to a hospital while i was having a stroke yeah don't do this don't do this yet. If you can avoid doing this, do not do this. Just ring emergency services, 911 in the US, triple zero in Australia, whatever it is in any other country. What was what how do you describe that journey? Is it like I said it or is it different? Um there was no fear. I wasn't um I wasn't scared. I knew there was something that needed to be done and it had to be done right now. And there was nobody else to depend on except myself. So I just, I felt that I was thinking very logically and very clearly. Um, obviously driving yourself to the hospital is not a clear way to think, nope. not in that situation. And a lot of people I'm sure do that. Um, but but you and I can attest to the fact that that's just not the best thing to do. Well, it's really dangerous because you can have a stroke and die while you're on the way because there's nobody to treat you. And you can have a car crash and you can sure. injure or kill somebody else on the way to okay. try to get help for yourself. So it is the worst thing to do. But I was... I was so unaware of anything else. Like I said to you, something else kicked in and I had no concept of what's right, wrong. I just needed to get help the, 
the best that I could. And believe it or not, the best way that I could wasn't to pick up my phone and look up at the street sign, which I was under and tell mm -hmm. the ambulance that I'm under this street sign and mm -hmm. I'm having a stroke and I'm in my car. That was mm -hmm. not going to be, that, that did not occur to me. And the ambulance being in the central business district is not far away. It'd be minutes away, if anything. Mm -hmm. But I just couldn't do it. It never occurred to me. So mm -hmm. I was driven by another, another, I have to say instinct. I don't know what the word is. I was driven by something else to get to that particular location, which was a hospital. Well, I think it sounds like you very similar to me. We're independent people. We've been driven all of our lives to make decisions and to make choices and to do it wisely. And this was just another situation where, okay, we've got a real serious problem here. Let's take care of it as quickly as possible. Yeah, you know, let's solve the problem. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. it's, a, it's a problem solving um, challenge and let's just work out a way to solve it, get to help and whatever mm -hmm. has to happen has to yeah. happen um your so you were 52 yes and you you think you woke up about two you think you got out of hospital about two weeks after your uh right. situation occurred what kind of stroke was it i was hemorrhagic um it was uh left side so i was paralyzed on the right um, it uh, was in the thalamic area of my brain, which um, I happen to be a teetotaler. Um, the most I have had to drink in my whole life was half a sojourn since I turned 21 because that was a rite of passage to have a drink on your 21st birthday. Found I did not like the taste of it or anything about it. But um, with this happening in the thalamus, the thalamus is like a long-sized gland within your brain, and uh, it's on both the right side and the left side. And it's also the area that controls your inhibitions. And so with that being damaged, um, I was like, I was like, um, I had no inhibitions. I had, uh, I had to learn manners all over again. Um, yeah, I did, I did some things are kind of funny, but no, we're, not, we're not proper. <laughs> are you going to share those? No, yes. <laughs> there, there's one in particular I'll share with you. When, when I had gotten to a point that I was... Uh, pretty mobile and pretty close to the time of coming home. Um, I was getting day passes here and there to come home for a few hours. And um, so our neighbor called and said, why don't we all go up to this favorite restaurant of ours for dinner? So we did. And uh, while we were up there, it was very crowded. Um, I was still using a cane but I chose not to bring the cane in with me. I didn't like to walk, walk with it if I didn't have to. And there was a, an area there where you could look at cards. And so there was a couple of people on one side and this huge, monstrous guy. He had to be six foot eight. I mean, he was huge. He looked like a Pillsbury Joe boy. He was just kind of round. He had a New York accent, which I love. But he had a New York guy set, and he had this big white leg that was just protruding from these, these like, daisy made uh, shorts. I mean, they, they, they were really obscene. And so they called our name. Now, my husband told me, he said, stay right here. Don't move. He had gone up to let them know that we needed a table for three. And then I guess he decided to go to the washroom before he came back to me. Well, in the meantime, they called our, light, our name over the PA. And I didn't see our neighbor and I didn't see my husband. I thought, uh, I was hungry. And I thought, I, I can't, I've got to get up there and get that table. 
So I started towards this gentleman, and he looked at me, and I looked at him and smiled, and he looked back at the cards. So I walked a little closer to him, and I went, <clears throat> he kind of glanced at me and looked back at the cards. You know, he didn't move. And so I thought, this, this, this is not right. So I backhanded him. <laughs> Back I just the... like so whack right on the back of his bottom and his barrel leg. He jumped straight up and there was an aisle right next to him and he spun around in the aisle and I just walked back and passed him like a proud peacock. I was so happy he moved so I could get that table. You, well, I told you smacked him, on the, you smacked him on the buttocks. Yes. <laughs> You know, like you do with a kid, you know, yeah. if you're telling your child to do something and they're yeah. not really listening to you, and you yeah. just go, hey, this message is for you. <laughs> so anyway, um, the next day I was sharing this message with the occupational therapist. Now she, at the time I was 52, she must have been about 35. And I was in my room, and I'm so proud of myself. And she sat down, and she said, Sister, you know, I, I love you. But she said, we need to talk about your manners. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, and whoever this man is, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a very benign look. Maybe you couldn't get away with it in 2021. I don't know. Maybe because the world's oh, going no. <laughs> mad. Because the world is going mad. Who knows? But it's Turn such a... <laughs> I'd be on the ground, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, possibly. But it's interesting because I felt like I became like that as well. But not because of what the stroke did. Just because my attitude changed. I wasn't going to pussyfoot around things that shouldn't be anymore it was just a it was a mindset shift it was like i'm just going to go down a particular path and i'm going to address it and i'm going to get an outcome and i'm not sure if that's going to be a good outcome or a bad outcome but i'm going to go for it and there's no time for drama yeah after you've had a stroke yeah you really really filter through your mind and you figure out what's important yep. in life you know um and yeah i know exactly what you're saying because i i felt the same way you know don't don't involve me in the pettiness of life that's not what's important yeah now kelly services i'm pretty sure is a recruitment agency wasn't it yes mm -hmm. for and uh for short-term assignments yep and you were involved with the um, with the people that you had recruited on behalf of Kelly Services and you would go to work to the particular location they were at and check in with them and check in with your client. Is that yes. the kind of role you had? Yes. But then after working with them for about six years, six or seven years, um, I had been chosen to work at Baxter Healthcare. They wanted to set up an on-site supervisor for temporary employment. Uh -huh. And they had like, oh gosh, 25, at least 25, 20, 30 um, different agencies and all of them were vying to, to do their business for them. And it just got to be unwieldy for Baxter. So they invited uh, Kelly Services to bring someone out there and, and put together a program and use maybe about five or six different agencies. Because we hired everybody from light industrial all the way up to engineers. Yeah. So were you able to get back to the work after the stroke? And if so, how long did it take for you to get back to work? Um, I didn't go back to work in that way. Um, that pretty much was over. Um, I did a lot of volunteer work. Um, in fact, one of the um, doctors at the rehab center had asked me 
um, to work with the hospital um, for helping stroke survivors that were new to the experience uh, to help them to know what was available to give some insights to both them and their families. So I did that for about maybe almost nine years. So loved it. So your your work life had to change because of the stroke. It did, but it was still just as demanding. I wasn't getting paid for anything I did, but I loved everything that I did do. Yeah. Now, I know that recently you've had some personal uh, tragedy, and I know that your beloved Bill um, passed away. What was he like during that time when you were at your worst and you needed to be supported and guided? How did he go about supporting you as far as how did it affect him? Um, he was he was amazing. He was amazing. He just um, he was just a very kind, very gentle soul, and uh, he kind of would just watch from a distance. You know, he just he let me just do my thing. And uh, if I got in trouble, he kind of reeled me back in. Um, he just, he's, after 47 years, I didn't say he just really was an amazing man. He's always been like that, all, all during our, our, um, our relationship. So both of us were kind of introverted in different ways, but we were both kind of introverted. But when it came to each other, you know, we just, we just, we could finish each other's sentences. We just, yeah. Stroke, really stroke tends to happen while people are experiencing life, their regular part of life. I, I, I raised Bill because I know that you, don't you know you want to honor on a bill and you want to do all the things that you set out to do and part of what helped you get there and overcome that was his support and his love I also wanted to raise it because a lot of stroke survivors will have a massive stroke a dramatic experience with their health and then they'll recover part of the way and then a life will happen in between they'll lose a loved one or um, often somebody else they know becomes unwell and it doesn't life doesn't get, get to go on pause so you can do the stroke recovery and then once you're recovered you can go back to life you you were 52 at the time how old are you now i'm 77 if you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. How long did you say your stroke recovery took or is it still also, are you still also forever in recovery? Are you still chasing better health or uh, a better outcome? What's that like? I think I think you're always recovering. Uh, there's there's certain things that I know 
I can't be. Um, but like you say, life gets in the way. You know, the way I look at myself right now is I'm a million dollar woman. Um, I've got um, a pacemaker. Uh, I broke my hip and had a hip replacement. <laughs> so my husband told me that I was a high maintenance woman. And he said, why don't you just go to the store and go shopping? <laughs> Do something low risk. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, you get to a point as you age uh, where you don't know if you can say that these things are happening because of the stroke or if they're happening just because you're aging. You know, and it's all a part of the life process. Um, so is, I go ahead. I was going to say, what are some of the things that you can't do? What are the things that you lost because of the stroke that you haven't been able to regain? Um, I still struggle with aphasia. Um, it's not real prominent like with some people, but there's times that I just, we could be in the middle of a conversation and I'm like, oh, what's that word? You know, and I'm just having a hard time coming up with it. Um, or my my words will slur, especially if I'm tired. Um, so I do practice with that. I try to. Um, I I try. See, I used to be a disc jockey back in another life, and so at that level, you really. I mean, your words have to be really sharp, and you have to be able to speak very quickly. And you have to think very quickly. And those are things that I'm not broadcast ready. <laughs> no. I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm just me now. And um, when it came to a point where um, I was asked about doing a podcast, I, I really kind of hesitated because I, I didn't think I could do it. And then I realized how I speak isn't as important as the message I have to share with others. I think how you speak is really important, actually. I, I actually um, enjoy it when I get aphasia, um, I'm going to call them warriors, aphasia warriors on the podcast, because mm -hmm. what it does is it encourages other people with aphasia to get on a podcast or do something that is so global right it's potentially going out to millions of people forever and i think it's important to break the barrier of oh i have aphasia i can't speak or i have aphasia i don't want to or i'm embarrassed by it or whatever now i don't have aphasia so it's not for me to tell you what to do by any by any stretch but that's why i encourage aphasia warriors to come on because if they don't and they miss this opportunity and they miss this, the next opportunity. I feel like it's a setback in their recovery. And I think that that mindset of not doing stuff is not going to help them improve one bit. So I've had a number of people who experience difficulty speaking on the podcast who perhaps have a different voice than what they used to. Um, and I even had a, a young kid, Jack, uh, I can't remember which episode it was. I'll check that up while we're chatting. Um, who couldn't speak at all, almost. But he was 19. And as soon as I reached out to him and said to him, Jack, do you want to be on the podcast? He said yes immediately. Now, I didn't know that he had aphasia to that extent. And he told me via email, he said, um, I have aphasia. And he tried to basically let me know the situation where he was at. The episode, I think, took us about, 20 or 30 minutes where he was uh, speaking and I was listening and just confirming whether or not what he said was what I heard. And we just went backwards and forwards and I edited that episode. So we didn't have all the quiet bits in between and all the stuff where it was a bit awkward, but we got to the end and we created a podcast and Jack at 19 was on his first podcast after having a stroke and having serious aphasia. Um, so I think, I think there's a, there's a place for 
there's I think there's a place for me intervening when you said what you said you didn't think you could do it etc and it's not typical this is not a typical podcast it's not about being the best episode it's not about presenting yourself in the best way having the best audio and the best background it's not about that this is about showing stroke the way that it is in every way shape or form i think and Jack was on episode 127. He's an amazing kid. And then a few months later, his mum sent an email and said, thanks so much for having Jack on the podcast. It, it's a real big deal that we had him on there. So that's the way I see it anyway. I, I, think, I think we have to, I, I think there's two things that we miss in the opportunity when we're recovering from the stroke. And and one is like you say, don't don't limit yourself. You know, try things whether you have a hard time with it or not. Just try. Yeah. Right after the stroke, right after I got home, um, I spoke with like a six year slur. I mean, <laughs> it was really something. And Bill and I had gone to a picnic. At um, at his sister's church, and they did it every year, and it was a big deal. And there was this one table; there was no place to sit, and there was this one table where there was like I think it was three people that were sitting at this one end, and they were saving that table for somebody. It certainly wasn't us or anybody else, and they were just drunk. I mean, really, really drunk. And I was having a hard time standing. I was I was getting very tired and I knew I either sat on the chair or I sat on the ground, but I was going to sit. <laughs> I didn't have a choice in that. And so I walked up to the woman that was there and asked her if she minded if I sat there. And when she heard my slur that was just as bad as hers. She put her arm around my shoulder. She said, tell the rest of your family to come on over. So you never know where it's going to lead you. And that was the other thing that I wanted to mention. As traumatic as a stroke is, and as devastating as it can be, and the work you have to do if you want to come back. And sometimes, unfortunately, some people have damages that cannot be repaired. And, and we have to respect that they are where they're going to be. But the thing is, is that no matter what the situation is, you can always find him. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And um, on episode 133, I interviewed Duncan Campling, and Duncan was uh, a locked in syndrome uh, person. And when I think he reached out to me to be on the podcast, I can't remember, I'm pretty sure he reached out to me. And again, I didn't know his condition. I, I never know anyone's condition really. And then when Duncan decided to come on board uh, and do the interview, he actually couldn't speak at all. He was using a machine to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, re Pre-recorded one of those computer generated voices where he would punch the words into a keypad and prepare, he prepared the sentences to questions that I sent him previously so that when I spoke about it in episode 133 and asked him the question, he just pressed enter and he gave me the answer to the question that I was going to ask. So this is the thing. Like, I think it's about, I think for me, what I'm trying to encourage is engagement. Just get engaged in some way, shape or form. Participate however you can. Nobody's actually thinking look at this guy, gal, weirdo, stupid person. Nobody's actually thinking that. That's just in your head. What they're doing is looking at you in awe, going, my God, how tough is this person? Yeah. And how much effort are they putting in? And that, that part of 
the story that you said where you found this connection with this person most of us have been through something traumatic believe it or not and therefore we have a lot more in common with that person that we don't know sitting next to us than we think and it, and it takes an engagement situation you need to engage with them you need to connect with them you need to have some kind of a conversation with them and you might just discover something you didn't expect yeah, it, it's funny you should mention this about uh, the g gentleman that had the uh, locked in syndrome. We just did a show uh, with Kadi and uh, Henny Vanderhoven. Um, they live in Finland, and she had been um, she had been a model. She's absolutely gorgeous, but she can't move. At all. There's nothing that moves on her. And we just did a show with her uh, in regards to wheelchair travel. She travels all over the world. And, uh, you know, I look at her and I think, if you can do it, I can do it. <laughs> you know? And she always has a smile on her face. And the, the two of them are just amazing people. Now, is that your podcast? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what's it called? It's called Don't Count Me Out. Don't Count Me Out. And is it, I know it's available on YouTube. Is it available on Apple Podcasts and all those places as well? Or is it just in a couple of I'm, spaces? I'm, uh, it's on there and it's on Resilience Talk Network. It's also on my website at joyanglin.com. Um, and I am going to uh, see if they'll accept me on Apple sometime either this weekend or next week for sure fantastic so anyhow i'll make sure the links that we do have wherever it is available at the moment i'll make sure that we link our podcast uh okay. show notes to that so anyone who comes along who is interested can find it there um now you also wrote a book i did yes now how long ago did you write that book um and tell me what it's called <laughs> it's called Trapped Within, and uh, I wrote it probably four months after I had this stroke. Wow! And you were t because I really felt uh, like when I read about you how there wasn't anything that we could find to help get through once you were. Once you were past the hospital and uh, uh, the rehab, um, and they deemed that you were miraculously cured, you were on your way and that was it. And so for you to find things to do that would help you, it, it was difficult to do. And the other thing that I wanted people to realize is that there's certain stages that you go through in the process before, you know, I mean, we can sit here and talk and, you know, kind of laugh about some of the things that happened to us. But in the beginning, um, I know for myself, I had a lot of the doctors and stuff that were trying to prepare me for a life of living in a wheelchair. You know, you may never walk again. You may never do this, but you're still you. I heard that so often. In fact, I wrote a whole chapter about that. Because don't, don't call me. Don't tell me that I'm still me. You know, I can't garden. So don't tell me I'm still me. No, we're good. I, I thought I lost you there for a moment and uh, you're back. So yeah. yeah. So go again. Uh, you can't garden. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't garden. I couldn't. I couldn't do anything that I did before. I only had one hand that worked. I couldn't walk. My eyesight was impaired. You know. So don't tell me I'm still me. You know. I used to ride horses. I was learning how to jump. Um, you know. There's a lot of things that I did. I was very physical and. Um, I couldn't do them anymore. 
Yeah, your you identity know, so, gets challenged dramatically. And if your identity yeah. is wrapped up, which for most of us, it's wrapped up on the things we do daily. If we can't do them again, there is a real yeah. crisis there. It's like, okay, so what do I do? What am I? Yeah. I'm not doing anything. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not myself. And you need to learn how to get beyond those feelings at the beginning and rediscover yourself or recreate yourself? How would you put it? I, I would say recreate. And um, the reason that seems to be more appropriate in my mind is because we recreate ourselves all the time. And ever since we were very, very young, we're always learning new things. We're always trying new things. And for some reason, some stroke survivors get stuck on wanting to be back to who they were and where they were. And, and they w wouldn't, in my estimation, be there now 10 years later anyway. They would have moved on. They would have found new experiences and new things to do. So I think if we can kind of open that door and, and let ourselves walk through it or wheel through it if we have to, but get through it somehow, we might find that we may not be the same, but we may be better. That's profound. What you just said is profound. That if we go back 10 years before the stroke, we had things we did, which we'd no longer do, which were taken away from us either by choice or by circumstances or by other situations. And yet we didn't stay stuck in the moment of, oh, I want to go back to those days where I was, I'm not sure what it was, you know, knitting or whatever it was. And now I can't do it. So my life is over and everything is terrible. Um, I, I love what you said that that that's a really profound statement. And I've never thought about using that uh, in that way and explaining it in that way. Um, so you rediscovered yourself you found that there was things that you couldn't do and then how did the evolution occur I, I imagine it happened sometime after you went home from rehab etc how did that well, evolution occur well one of the things because my walking was very very bad but by the time i got out of rehab i was back to walking supposedly with the cane i usually used my husband's uh, arm <laughs> instead of a cane but uh, and then I would always leave the cane in the back seat of the car you know, I just happened to forget it but I didn't walk real steady and I had been a line dancer um, before I had my stroke and so my sister-in-law because you know you can hang on to somebody's arm or you just have certain steps you do and you, you learn those. Well, we ended up going line dancing once a week. And at first I started off just by sitting in the chair and letting my legs follow the, the steps until I got the steps down. And then I would hold on to my sister-in-law and do it. And then Sue, the teacher, talked to us and found out what my story was, she would come over and grab my arm and take me up in front and have me, you know, go through it with her. And I felt so comfortable and confident with her that it just started to, to roll. And, and I did it for years. So. Yeah. Exercise is really good for helping to repair and heal the brain. It also supports making new neurons. It supports your fitness. I mean, exercise is really important. Any way, shape or form that you can get exercise is important. And that's awesome that you did it at the beginning. It was just in a chair and you were just wiggling your legs around until you got the steps right. That's exercise. That's really all it takes. It's amazing that, um, that you did that. Now, the book, Trapped Within, a true story about survival, recovery, love and hope. Uh, it's an awesome cover. I love the cover. Um, Thank you. There's a little paragraph on the front page that says, 
and I'll have an image of it as well for anyone who wants to have a look at it in the show notes, that, that there's some words there that say trapped within is a powerful and intimate story about the endurance of the human spirit during a time of life threatening crisis by Richard Paul Evans, number one, New York Times bestselling author. Yes. Who's Richard, Paul, who's Richard Paul Evans? Richard Paul Evans um, is a very dear friend of mine, and he just went through some surgery, so anyone who knows who he is, wish him well right now. Um, but Richard, <laughs> if you ask him to describe the types of books he writes, he says, I write books that make women cry. Oh. He writes love stories. They're not... They're, they're not sexual. They're, they're stories about relationships, you know, and something that someone is working on to make their life better. Maybe it's a broken relationship between a father and a child. Um, and um, he, just, he just writes beautiful stories. They're, they're sensitive, they're loving. And uh, there's something that both men and women enjoy. Um, he wrote a series of books uh, called Michael Day that are for young boys. Um, and I've not read them yet, but I, I want to. And it's about a character that's a teenager that's flawed. He has Tourette's syndrome. But he does some amazing things. And... Um, yeah, Richard is, he's a very, very special man. Yeah. And what's your book about? I know, I know it's a true story about survival, recovery, love and hope. But what, if I asked you what your book is about, what, what, why did you write it? What was it about? I know you wrote it because there wasn't much going on at the time. But what's it about? How do you, what message are you trying to get across? What I wanted to do was to help other stroke survivors, no matter where they were in, in their recovery, to look and see that some of the steps that they may be going through, that others have been there as well. And uh, so just keep going. Just, just go through the process. I found after the last edit that I did on the book, and read through the whole thing, um, which I did about 70 times, but um, that's another story. But um, I found that it actually is a grieving process. It's very close to um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and what she has written about grieving and all of the steps that you have to go through. And you may go through more than once. Um, and so uh, it, it helped me to be able to say goodbye to the me that I had been before. And I was able to do it with a great deal of love and, and uh, fondness for who I'd been. I worked on hard to become the person I was. You know, and so you have to go through that. How dare you take me away? And I think that was the hardest obstacle for me to, to face was that my body actually betrayed me. You know, you rely on your body to take care of you, and it didn't. And that was the hardest one for me to forgive. We take it for granted that our body's going to do that eternally, yeah. but it doesn't because it's not meant to. And then we've got to come to terms with it. When you have that awareness, that's the real hard part. Some of us are oblivious to life until life happens. And then it's really tough to come to terms with it. And I get it. And it's a, it's a journey that we're all going to go on no matter who you are a condition or something, a life event is going to make life happen to you too. And I think it's meant to, that's the thing. That's the part that I got out of my experiences. Life's meant to be happening to us. It's not meant to be all roses and 
and just non non events of achieving greatness and amazing stuff and doing all the things that you love and always having calmness and that's that's not life that's i think that's not that's the complete opposite of life that's not being alive at all at least now i feel like um i know what it's like to nearly not be alive and i prefer whatever i'm dealing with even though it's not pleasant because it's not always not pleasant and the part that's not always not pleasant is the part that i create that is really a, an important message is that what's important is that we look for things to balance out the terrible parts in our life that's and create those good moments and good memories because we're responsible for those they're not just going to happen to you it's very rare that somebody is going to turn up and give you the amazing experience that you want exactly the way that you want it you have to create that that's our job our job is to create balance between the things that happen to us that we can't control like life and flip it so that the balance is in the favor of the good things so that when terrible things happen we can deal with them quite easily does that resonate absolutely yeah and and, and i also think i don't think people gain compassion without having challenges uh, how, how would you ever know what compassion is mm -hmm. You, know, you wouldn't recognize it if it passed you on the street, yeah. if you hadn't uh, had experienced something devastating in your own life. Joanne, I really enjoyed our chat. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with you and following your ongoing journey. I am truly sorry that you lost your beloved Bill recently. Yeah. And uh, I wish you well from here on. And I hope that you'll remember him fondly, like I'm sure you do. And uh, I feel his presence around me all the time. Yeah. yeah. So. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. I just, uh, I've enjoyed this so much. And uh, one of these days, I want to have you on our broadcast too. Anytime. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me on today's Recovery After Stroke podcast. Do you ever wish there was just one place that you could go to for resources, advice, and support in your stroke recovery? Whether you've been navigating your journey for weeks, months, or years, I know firsthand how difficult it can be to get the answers you need. This road is both physically and mentally challenging, from reclaiming your independence to getting back to work to rebuilding your confidence and more. Your symptoms don't follow a rule book. And as soon as you leave hospital, you no longer have medical professionals on tap. I know for me, it felt as if I was teaching myself a new language from scratch with no native speaker in sight. If this sounds like you, I'm here to tell you that you're not alone and there is a better way to navigate your recovery and build a fulfilling life that you love. I've created an inclusive, supportive and accessible membership community called Recovery After Stroke. This all-in-one support and resource program is designed to help you take your health into your own hands. This is your guidebook through every step in your journey, from reducing fatigue to strengthening your brain health to overcoming anxiety and more. To find out more and to join the community, head to recoveryafterstroke.com. See you next time. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. 
content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency, or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk, and we are not responsible for any information you find there.